Okay, this is week two of our ethics ser three-week series, as Jennifer indicated. And today I want to share with you some of the ethical and moral practices of manufacturing businesses and their managers that I worked for and with in Taiwan and China during the 20 years that I worked for Stanley Tools living in those two countries, Taiwan and China, between 85, 1985 and 2005. Um, I use the words worked for Chinese businessmen because in the second year after I immigrated with my family to Taiwan, uh, Stanley Tools bought what was then the largest mechanics tool company in the world for $100 million. Uh, it had plants in Dallas, Texas, and also in Taichung, Taiwan. So I was asked to drop what I was beginning to do in my first two years in Taiwan uh, and move to Taichung, uh, leave my wife behind in Taipei, uh, and go 100 miles south and run the factory that we had purchased in Taiwan and work for this gentleman, Mr. Chow. Um, I will give you a little more insight into Mr. Chow and his business practices uh, a little later in the hour. Uh, I want to start with a caveat, apology, and a disclaimer. Next, next slide, Laura. Uh, the caveat and apology and disclaimer is simply to say to all of you that I want to assure you that today's Chinese CEOs, whether they're in any of the Taiwan, the Chinese-speaking countries, by and large, with a few notable exceptions, follow ethical business practices like their American counterparts. The experiences and behavior patterns I will be sharing with you are not representative of non-manufacturing businesses, nor are they patterns still true today, nor are they reflective of the ethical and moral practices of other Pacific Rim exporting manufacturing countries like Japan, Taiwan, Korea, uh, Korea Thailand, and Vietnam. Uh, they are reflective of Chinese factory-based businesses in the 1980s and 1990s in virtually all manufacturing sectors. And to move into the third bullet point on this particular slide, I want to share with you all with, with, with all of you, what I've learned in 54 years of hard goods manufacturing, starting in 1966, uh, to be the number one motivator of CEOs and managers to behave morally and ethically. Sadly, it's not something they learn from their fifth grade Sunday school teachers. Hmm. Um, what, what I learned was that I don't want as a CEO, my board of directors or the public at large to read negatively about me or my company, keep me off the front pages of the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and the Washington Post at all costs. The greatest fear of a CEO, whether it's Jamie Dimon at J.P. Morgan Chase or Pfizer CEO, very much in the news today, Albert Berea, is a 7 a.m. wake-up call on a Monday morning from his chief legal counsel asking him if he's seen the front page of today's Wall Street Journal. So, next slide, Laura. Okay, we're gonna move now quickly into the government factory regulations that monitor business practices in the Chinese speaking countries with which I'm most familiar, Taiwan and China. By the late 1980s, China had begun inheriting many of the factory orders that had moved from the US to Mexico and from Western Europe to Eastern Europe and from Japan in the 1950s after World War II to Korea in the 1960s and then finally to Taiwan in the 1970s and on to China in the 80s and 90s. Perhaps the best example of this migration of business 
following the US dollar around the globe is General Electric, GE, a company we all know under CEO Jack Welch. Neutron Jack, as he used to be called in our business media, a name that he deservedly earned when his, in, in his first five years as chief executive at GE, you may remember he closed plants right and left across the world, dismissing 100,000 employees, 25% of the workforce at GE. In the 1980s, Welch moved much of GE's manufacturing of appliances, medical equipment, and jet engines to Mexico. This was at the time of NAFTA, only to discover that the time and cost of exporting raw materials and tooling from the US to Mexico, assembling product at $5 an hour, and then re-importing the assembled products back into the US as finished goods was much more expensive than equipping Chinese factories with the know-how to make all these same GE products at $2 an hour and exporting them back to the US. So most of that GE business, as I found when I arrived there in the 80s, had begun to come over to Taiwan and China. China's government regulations now uh, moving to the rest of this slide, uh, Chinese government regulations for employee safety, fire prevention, air and water pollution, uh, working hours, overtime, holiday pay, and child and prison labor were all copied verbatim from the identical documents in America. Uh, I say that because when I started sourcing products for Stanley from China, I would ask to see these regulations that they had, thinking that I would, I would have to have them translated into English so that I could understand how they were different from the same regulations that we had used in the United States. To my amazement, they would show me regulations in English which were direct Xerox copies of the American regulations. So whether they followed them or not was another story. But in order to satisfy people like myself who were asking for these documents so that we could, so that we could verify that they were in fact following proper international practices with regard to these criteria, for safety, um, they had literally gotten a hold of all the same documents from America in English, copied them, and distributed them to the factories. These had to do with fire doors between departments in a factory, stairwells and elevator shafts, hydrants within 100 feet of the employee entrance, uh, sprinkler systems in the ceilings, of all departments, uh, testing the air and water for parts per million of pollutants, uh, factory working conditions, uh, dormitory living conditions, uh, and the payrolls had to match the hours worked. So they had all of these regulations. And so I began to then ask questions as I started working closely with these factories, only to find out that the Chinese inspectors from the government would come around once a month and the plant manager would hand the inspector a bag, a brown bag that looked like something you'd have your lunch in. And in the brown bag was a, was a pack of Chinese money, like dollar bills. And that was the payoff to the inspector for going away and signing off that this factory was in compliance. Meanwhile, they were polluting the air, polluting the water, disobeying the fire safety regulations, um, working people overtime, hiring children 
This was in the 80s and on into the 90s. Obviously, it's been caught up with by any American manufacturers like us that work with these companies. And one by one, they would stop this practice because obviously it was totally unethical and illegal as well as being immoral. So uh, that's, that's the kind of thing that went on. A, literally a bag of money was prepared every month so that the inspector could go away, take the bag of money back to his particular office and share it with his brethren. And that's how they got through the early days of dealing with international businesses that used their country as the base of exportation. Uh, I want to carry you now into some of the specific examples of what I found when I started doing business there uh, in my early years in the 80s. This particular example comes from Taiwan. So if I can ask Laura to uh, move to the next slide. Uh, here, is a, here is a picture on your screen, if you can see it, of in-home child labor. Um, this happens to be a picture, you can't see the grandmother, but she's there overseeing four children before school, and they're home doing the same thing after school. This is indicative of how families lived in the 80s and 90s, and still many today, where grandmother, grandfather, father and mother are all living together intergenerationally in three generations in the same apartment. And so what would happen is an agent representing a particular product would come into the home and say to the family, I would like to bring you on Monday morning all the parts that you need to assemble a particular product and I'll come back on Friday afternoon and I'll pick up everything that you and your family have assembled. These are the kids doing this work before and after school, when they come home before they've done their homework, I guess. And the grandmother would then have these all put together and this agent would pay her for these assembled products. Laura, let's go to the next slide. The product that I saw when the agent brought me to one of these high-rise tenement buildings, took me up to the 12th floor and we knocked on the door and the grandmother opened the door. I saw the grandmother and three or four kids on the floor assembling Spalding golf umbrellas. Like, I, I've got one here in my hand. I can't show you this, but you can imagine I'm holding a golf umbrella in my hands. And if Laura will take us now to the next slide, I can tell you that each golf umbrella has about 29 parts. And you can see them here all on the screen. And the only special piece of equipment that you need is a rivet gun in order to uh, rivet some of the parts, uh, like the runners have to be riveted to the shaft and the uh, stretchers need to be riveted to the canopy on the top. Otherwise, the kids are putting this whole thing together. Um, and so the agent would come back at the end of the week. And in this particular case that I saw of the Spalding golf umbrellas, he was giving the family the equivalent of four cents, US four cents for every assembled umbrella. Because he was delivering all these parts and they were assembling them and they got the equivalent of four, 
So at the end of the week, if they had assembled five, 600, 700 umbrellas, they got that times four cents. So I looked at this guy and I said, what's this got to do with me? He said, well, you guys are here to put up a Stanley factory. And I know from meeting you that you're, you're going to assemble Stanley tape measures in there. We'll go to the next slide now, Laura. It's the, uh, the familiar Stanley tape measure that you see on the screen. I've got one here with, with me here in the, in the picture you see. Uh, inside this tape measure, there's something like 11 parts, and it requires the use of a rivet gun and a motorized winder to put it together. So I was there opening our first Asian factory in 1985 when I was asked to move to Taichung when we bought this mechanics tool factory. Well, my colleagues went on to continue opening it, and we were we were going to assemble Stanley tapes. And this agent was showing me this grandmother and her kids and as, as an example of what he was proposing that he do for me. He was going to collect all these parts, these 11 parts that go into a tape measure, and he was going to bring them to apartments that he had lined up on Monday morning, and he'd give them a motorized winder that we'd set them up with, and he was going to deliver back to me on Friday completely assembled tape measures, and he proposed that he do it for four cents per tape just like he was paying the grandmother for the golf umbrellas. And so that was my first lesson in the ethics and morality of business in China and Taiwan. So I can tell you right now, I didn't even go to my corporation to talk about this. I simply rejected it out of hand and said, no, we, we're not going to do that. We, we, we have a factory that's going to do that. We're going to pay our employees a proper wage, and it's not going to include children. So thank you very much. See you later. So that was my next example of how this all was going to try to come together. Let's see. Let's see if we can uh, move on now to the next slide, Laura. Uh, I want to share with you what I began to learn as I worked with this $100 million acquisition that Stanley made of the largest mechanics tool factory. Uh, my, my close friend and colleague who was managing the Dallas, Texas plants uh, was in the same position I was. I was doing that management in Taiwan. He was doing it in Dallas, Texas. So we, we talked to each other all the time. And we discovered that there were a lot of things that weren't up to snuff ethically with how Stanley ran its factories in the United States and elsewhere in the world. Um, one of the areas that we discovered problems was the Mr. Chow's methods of dealing with what I will call problem employees. So this was a practice followed not just by Mr. Chow, but my many other Taiwanese and Chinese business persons um, at that time. They had a high level key person in the human resources department with access to the chairman and his or her spouse. Uh, in this case of the factory in Taichung uh, that I worked with, um, the key person turned out to be the brother-in-law of Mr. Chow, his, his wife's brother. Uh, and I went to him early in my time there and asked him what he did for the business. He was not the he was not the manager of the HR department, but he worked in that department. And he said, well, I work for Mr. and Mrs. Chow. I, I don't work for the boss that I have, but I, follow, I take my orders from Mr. and Mrs. Chow, and they come to me and ask me to help out 
with problems. And their strategy was to deal with problems by escalating the rewards up the scale. He said from one to five. And if that didn't work, he would escalate the punishments down the scale one to five until he achieved correct, what he, what I called corrective action. And I wanna share with you an example of this. So if we can go to the next slide, Laura. What you see here is a man in his factory uniform picketing out, outside the Apple iPhone factory. As you, as you probably all know, iPhones are largely made in China. Now, the particular factory that I worked for and with whom I was talking was in Taiwan. But the practice was the same. If the employees had some sort of disgruntlement, as, as they would in the United States, they would pick it in front of the building. This particular gentleman is picketing the conditions in the Apple iPhone factory in China. And he's got a little sign there, heartless apple, rotten apple. Um, so uh, the case that my friend in Taichung, Taiwan, shared with me had to do with a picketer in front of the factory gates every day when the factory workers let out at 5 p.m. This particular gentleman, who was a foreman in the factory, was picketing with signs because he did not get a promotion that he felt was rightly deserved. Uh, he wanted to move up the line, and he felt that he had justified becoming a manager of several departments, and he didn't get the job. So he was out front picketing. Mr. Chow's factory. And Mr. Chow had told his brother-in-law, we got to deal with this guy. We got to end this. I can't have this guy picketing in front of my factory. So instead of dealing with the problem and sitting down with the employee as would happen today over there as well as in the United States, what this brother-in-law was charged to do was give this guy some sort of positive inducements to stop picketing. Well, he had gone through all the five escalating rewards and it had not worked. This foreman was still out front picketing. I actually saw the guy picketing out front. And so now this brother-in-law was charged with going down the scale. So what he, he did with Mr. Chow's authority was he went out and he, he found out that this foreman's wife ran a gaming parlor in downtown Taichung City uh, where kids after school would come and play the games in this gaming parlor um, and put their pennies, nickels, and dimes in Taiwan equivalents into these gaming machines and maybe get a reward or not out of this thing. And, and that's how she made her money, This the wife of the foreman. So the brother-in-law decided to send a couple of guys. If you'll go to the next slide, Laura. This is the pachinko. This is a, a view of a typical pachinko parlor. They have them all over Japan, China, and Taiwan, where these grade school kids come after school to spend their money. Try to imagine a store full of these machines where kids are spending their money. What this brother-in-law did to sort of change the attitude of this disgruntled foreman. Let's go to the next slide. He sent 
two guys that look like this guy. This, I happen to get this picture online of a typical Chinese mafia goon. Uh, and imagine the effect on the wife's business if two of these guys like him stood out in front of the store after school telling the kids to go home. Gambling is illegal. Well, that's exactly what happened. And the wife of this disgruntled foreman told her husband to stop picketing the factory. He stopped immediately. It ended the problem. So this is the example that I simply wanted to share with you so that you, you would have an understanding of how business was done. And, and I suspect that this practice uh, originally must have come from Japan because the Chinese businessmen in the 80s took most of their cues from the way businesses were done at that time in Japan. Um, and that behavior pattern had migrated its way through the Pacific Rim to places like Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, and Indonesia. Um, so that's uh, where I am in, in this talk, and I would be happy to uh, entertain, we're only halfway through the hour, Laura, but I would be happy to entertain any questions that, that you may have. Uh, I, I went on to continue to run this operation in Taichung, and I ended up opening businesses all over China. Uh, we opened a tape measure factory in, outside of Bangkok, Thailand. We opened a plier factory in Indonesia. Um, and so that's pretty much how my time went there. Uh, and what I tried to do was instill as much ethical business practice from what I had experienced in the way we ran our factories in the United States, where we followed true government regulations with regard to air and water pollution, employee safety, all the OSHA equipment that you need to install on factory machines so that workers don't get their fingers or hands in the equipment when you operate the equipment. Uh, none of these were in use at the time over there because it simply was easier for the employees if they could make more production if they didn't have these uh, safety devices on them. And of course, that was insanity because periodically you'd have men and women losing fingers uh, and injuring themselves simply because they were trying to outsmart the equipment and get rid of the safety precautions uh, by not having them on the equipment. Well, we, we couldn't have that, obviously, so we had to completely change the way the practices were followed there. Uh, it, it was painful for those managers and employees to have to learn these lessons the hard way.